Tonight we come to the final sermon in the series, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? So I invite you to go online if you'd like to uh, see the other sermons and uh, read them or hear them. Tonight I also would like to share an additional gospel lesson, one that often gets lost on Christmas Eve, but is part of the readings for Christmas Eve. John 1, 1 through 5. Listen to these words that come in the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. This prologue to the Gospel of John is a passage that is hidden in plain sight. One week ago, we heard it as the final lesson in the service of Lessons and Carols. We hear it each Monday, Thursday as the final reading in the Tenebrae service before the Christ candle is extinguished. It is listed each year as a reading for Christmas, but it always is the last choice for Christmas Eve because it's buried in Luke's telling of the birth of Jesus in a barn with an innkeeper, with angels and shepherds and sheep and cattle all around, and sometimes some will add the, epist the, the other story from um, Epiphany of the Ma Matthew's description of the wise ones joining from the east. John gets lost at Christmas. We love John's poetry, but the poet is pushed off center stage by Luke, the journalist, writing the who, what, when, and where of the Bethlehem birth. John brings us the why. We never hear why. We come to Christmas for certitude, and the mystical poet does not give us certitude. So John waits in the wings, the forever understudy, listening and silent in the stillness of this night. In this, my final sermon for Christmas, I bow to the mysterious and elusive poet and the author of John's Gospel. Finally comes the poet. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Two sentences captivate poetic and prophetic imagination in the Gospel of John in the first chapter. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. John audaciously declares that we would not be here, we wouldn't exist except for Christ. All things came into being through him, has always seemed outrageous on the surface, even exclusivistic on the surface. So how does John know this? Who told him that all things came into being through Jesus? But there is something deep within me that trusts John. I trust the poet. Sometimes what is on the surface speaks to a truth that is deep in the human soul and the divine consciousness, and I believe this is one of those deep truths. Why not bring all life, all hope, all beauty, all everything into the world from the creation, the inception of the world itself through him, the one who is light and life and love? Why not? After all, he is God's embodiment for all that is good. Why not declare this prophetic and poetic truth? It is the perfect setup to explain what happens next. The light, not a light, shines in the present tense in the darkness and the darkness did not past tense overcome it darkness did not overcome the light darkness cannot overcome the light darkness will never overcome the light darkness always and forever tries and does ultimately succumb to the light in a world that walks in darkness plays in darkness, is titillated by darkness, seeks darkness, light wins. Light 
will prevail, no matter what the challenges, no matter what the odds, light wins over darkness. Following the end of the war to end all wars, AKA World War I, another great poet, William Butler Yeats wrote The Second Coming. His words spoke to a grieving world about a turn that they were facing once again, following the horrors of trench warfare, to an unknown and difficult to perceive new world order. It was Christmas 1919 when Yeats wrote The Second Coming, and so I invite another poet to join John on center stage to come from the wings this Christmas Eve and join us in the center as he vexes your Christmas certitude. Yeats wrote, turning and turning in the widening jair, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dim tide is loosened, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out. What a vast image of the Spiritus Mundi. Troubles my sight somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a glaze, a gaze blank and a pitiless, and as pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about real shadows of the indignant desert birds, the darkness drops again. But now I know that 20th, 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. We can feel the rough slouching beast coming toward Bethlehem tonight, 104 years later. As the creature arrives, tonight he finds Manger Square empty. The pastors and priests of the Palestinian Christians there have canceled Christmas in Bethlehem tonight. The first time in 2,000 years Christmas has been canceled at the place of Jesus' birth. They have assembled a crash. It isn't subtle, nor is it intended to be. Instead of a pastoral-looking nativity scene, the crash features baby Jesus wrapped in a Palestinian kafia, surrounded by jagged chunks of stone evoking bombed-out buildings in the Gaza Strip and children buried beneath them. Surrounded this surreal and devastating manger scene are Mary and Joseph, the shepherds and angels, the three wise men. They're all in the rubble looking for life. Pastor Munther Isaac says this, the Palestinian pastor of the Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. I see God in the rubble a town that has revered the birthplace of Jesus is silent tonight. And Christ was born under occupation, he continues. Pastor Isaac reminds us that the days after Jesus' birth, there were hundreds of firstborn babies slaughtered by King Herod as vicious a killer king that ever lived to exterminate the newborn savior. Tonight in Bethlehem, Singing voices are stilled, while the only sounds breaking the silence are missiles splitting the air and mothers and fathers screaming with the burial of their babies. With only 3,000 Christians in Gaza and hundreds having already died in the siege, the very future of Christians in Palestine is bleak as we stand close to extinction there over a thousand Christians are hiding in two compounds, two churches in the Gaza, the only two left standing. And last week, two women crossed through the open square in the church compound and were killed by snipers. They were not terrorists. They were a mother and a daughter trying to bring food across the square to their family. Two more Christians dead. Tonight, the newborn Jesus 
is weeping. We need to weep too. Tonight, the light is barely flickering in Bethlehem. Tonight, no services can sing joy when over 1,500 Israeli soldiers and innocents lay slain. Tonight, there is no peace when more than 20,000 Palestinian terrorists and innocents lay slain. Two truths are wrapped tonight in this one land we call holy. First, Hamas is a terrible, destructive, and evil organization of terror whose terrorist attack on October 7th has unleashed the horrors of war on those on the West Bank and Gaza. And second, Israel's response against Hamas has devastated and utterly destroyed an entire people on a small strip of land. People who have nowhere to go, nowhere to hide, no food, no water, and little hope. We too often will name one truth and forsake the other, depending on who we're listening to, and this is something we do in lots of parts of our lives. But the beast that slouches toward Bethlehem tonight calls us to speak two truths, not one. We cannot name one truth and be silent about the other. The land of holiness is not the only place where two truths stumble along tonight in our land. We find that we are faced with our own conflicting set of truths as we stand at the doorway of 2024. We have a former president running for president, the presidency again, with 91 counts of crimes stacked against him, who still denies he lost an election and led an insurrection to prove it, running largely unopposed. And we have a weak, feeble-looking and sounding past his prime president ready to run for re-election as he seeks to serve until he is almost 87 years old. Both things are true, whether we want to talk about them or be honest. Is this the best way for the greatest nation on earth to produce its leader, to guide us into the future? Along with too many Americans, the world is wondering tonight, what is wrong with America? that stands in such darkness and descends into this time. We live with many dueling truths. Here are two more. In a few hours, our doors will open again, and we will welcome God's highly favored ones, the dispossessed, the disinherited, the lonely, the poor, along with hundreds of volunteers who seek to bring light, life, and love to their neighbors, people will have Christmas right here in this sanctuary and down in Parish Hall. Self-admittedly, those who serve will say that they receive much more than they give. The embodiment of the light will be ever-present here, sharing the language of love from many different faiths and parts of the world. That is true, but also true is the growing number of people in our community who don't have homes, who can't sustain a place to live anymore and have no place to call home for the night. The truth hurts when we and they can name it out loud. One meal, one day, cannot fill the gaps left by so many places in need of help, so many people. Two truths call us to do the work of mercy and justice. John, the understudy poet, has come from the wings to center stage tonight, and he cries to us. He cries to our hearts. He cries to us to wake up, to live God's truth in love. He cries to us to name and claim Jesus as the hope of the world. He cries to us to fight back the darkness with the light of God. Like Yeats, John sees that things fall apart, that the center cannot hold when anarchy is unleashed and when the blood-dimmed tide is loosed, when everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned, and when the best lack conviction and the worst are full of passion, uh, are, are full of passionate intensity. But finally comes our poet. And unlike his brother William, our poet John shows us not just that the worst, but also the best are full of passionate intensity. He shows us that the divine spark 
light overcoming darkness wins every time. He shows us that the center can hold if the light of the world is the center. He shows us that light shining on the edge of darkness, there it is where God exercises power as God's faithful, loving, committed accompaniment to vulnerability. And all of this is given by the poet to invite us to become more like the God who dwells among us and in us and seek to find a home for ourselves. In the incarnation, God's two truths come together to make sense. All things came into being through him and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. God enacts the kind of divine love that enters empathetically into human experience, self-identifying with glory and agony in human life from within, and then identifying every day with the godless and the God-forsaken everywhere in this world who are looking for God. In Jesus, the incarnation born in Bethlehem, God finds a way through the darkness. God looks upon life and light and love in this world a world that God has created and says, I will give you a chance. The word made flesh is dwelling among you. And God says one more time, this is good. Amen.